Welcome to our sharing on the book of Genesis. And I want to go into chapter 42 and begin the great drama that happens between Joseph and his brothers. It may seem haphazard or strange to us when we look at it first, but uh, I'm going to try and examine it for you and um, enter into each segment so that you realize that Joseph has a plan and the plan works out absolutely marvelously. He just does it according to the time that he's living in. It's just different to the way we would do things today naturally. But Joseph's plan is to, first of all, try and get his brothers to repent. Secondly, to try and unify them. And thirdly, to try and get Jacob to come down to Egypt where he can take care of him and to get the whole family to come down to Egypt. Now, there's nothing worse than a seven-year famine because the effect on the people uh, in year three, four, five, and six is lethal. And many people would die unless uh, something happens to protect them. And I want to show you the extraordinary generosity of Joseph to a family that was so terrible to him in his youth. So let's begin. And chapter 42 begins with, uh, when Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. So go down to that place and buy for us so that we can live and not die. Very interesting that the whole text begins with, why are you looking at one another? So here we begin the great drama in Jacob's family and neither Jacob nor his family realize what's going on and yet they are brought through an entire process by Joseph. So the simple thing is that there's grain in Egypt, there's famine in the land of Canaan. So Jacob says uh, to his sons who are now uh, middle-aged men that they are to go down to Egypt to buy a grain and he sees the discomfort that's in his sons the very mention of Egypt is lethal to them because it stirs their conscience as to what they have done and they know they have a brother in Egypt who they sold as a slave now Jacob doesn't know that they have told Jacob a lie that he has absorbed for the past 20 years uh, and that is that his son is dead so Jacob says, well, why are you looking at each other? I mean, why should it be unusual for you to go to Egypt? So right from the very beginning, the word Egypt stirs up their consciences. And in spite of that, Jacob says, you must go because otherwise we're all going to die. Jacob had 12 sons. One of them is in Egypt. That's Joseph, that's 11. And he sends 10 of them. He's not going to send Benjamin. And so Benjamin becomes the center of this whole struggle. Benjamin is Jacob's last contact with his beloved wife, Rachel. And Rachel only bore him two sons and one of them is already gone and in Jacob's mind is dead. So he's not going to let the second one go. And somehow in Jacob's mind, I cannot let Rachel's second son go to Egypt. Now he hasn't worked it out why he's thinking that way, but somehow Egypt and Rachel's sons don't go together and he's just not going to do it. God is about to do something absolutely marvelous in this family. I've already told you that this family uh, was very dysfunctional, that these men who are being sent down to Egypt had grown up in a family where there was strife, where there was war between the mothers, where there was envy, where there was absolutely negative stuff going on. And the four eldest brothers haven't actually passed themselves very well up to this particular point. But they are the chosen people in spite of their weaknesses and in spite of everything. And they need to become a nation. And the only way they can become a nation is that they actually go down to Egypt. Now, they don't realize that. But we have watched uh, right from the time of Abraham that Ishmael decided to 
get lost in the whole Canaanite culture. We've seen that Esau has gone down that direction. We've seen that even Judah has married into the Canaanite culture. So if God leaves them in the land of Canaan right now, they'll all just be assimilated into that culture and the chosen people will be no more. And so God allows a crisis to happen so that he can sort everything out. Just think about it. God often allows a crisis in our lives as well so that he can sort things out and that he can bring us to a much better place and that we can live out the fullness of our calling. So a trial or a tribulation that comes to us is often the greatest blessing that happens to us. We don't think that uh, when we're actually going through it. I pointed out to you at an earlier point in Jacob's life that he had to go through a hard school in order to humble him and to try and make a man of God out of him. Now, it's the same thing with his children. His sons have to go through this process as well. And so God will bring them down to Egypt. He will build them up into a nation. Then he will allow a new Pharaoh who doesn't remember Joseph uh, to actually persecute them. And that persecution will make them uncomfortable enough to be actually ready to leave Egypt in the Exodus. So massive movement of history is about to take place. So in verses five to six, let me read this for you because this is wonderful. The sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed for the famine uh, in the land of Canaan. So there would have been huge uh, numbers of people going down to Egypt. Verse six. Now Joseph was governor over the land and it was he who sold all the people, sold all the grain to anybody who came. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them instantly but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them and said, where do you come from? They said from the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And the drama begins. So arriving in Egypt is a major moment for these men. And the first thing they do is they bow to the ground before the administrator of Egypt not knowing it's their brother Joseph. Joseph's dream is fulfilled. He told them that his family would bow down before him. And they decided to kill him because of that. And now that death is facing them, they come and bow before him, but they don't know it's him yet. That's going to take time. 20 years earlier, they had plotted against Joseph to defeat his dreams to destroy the word and to not allow the dream to come true. But you see, God in his divine providence is able to override all our sinfulness and all our weaknesses to bring about what he declared anyway. So because Joseph remained faithful to God, then God can actually bring about what he intended through those dreams. A uh, hardship for Joseph was going to bring about an enormous grace to everybody. And hardship for these men is also going to bring about a great good for his family. So let us not read what happens here on a superficial level. Of course, Joseph instantly recognized his brothers, but he acted as a stranger. He's going to hold back and he does something uh, that initially they would, wouldn't suspect anything at all. He spoke to them through an interpreter. So if he speaks to them in Egyptian through an interpreter, he's not giving them any indication that he knows what they're saying. This is terribly important because if he stays in that position, he can get them to actually uh, speak in front of him and he will learn everything he needs to learn from them. And then we're told that he spoke roughly to them. Uh, so why would he speak roughly? Don't forget this man has been 12 years in jail. He has been treated very badly. Even though when his son Manasseh was born, he thought that he had been able to put all of this behind him. But the sight of his 10 brothers in front of him brings 
all the anger and all the anguish and all the pain of all these years right up. He probably didn't know he would give such a strong reaction uh, if he actually met them. And so he interrogates them. We have to remember something that Pharaoh said in chapter 41, verse 38. Can we find such a man as this in whom the Spirit of God dwells? And they recognized the wisdom that was in Joseph. And because they recognized the wisdom that was in Joseph, they were prepared to put the whole of Egypt into his care. Now, if we remember that in Joseph's dealings with his brothers, then we might begin to see that there is a plan. These 10 brothers must be brought to acknowledge their sin against Joseph. They must be brought to repent of that sin. They must show some signs of recovery. And only if Joseph sees that their hearts have changed from where they were 20 years ago, will he actually show himself. So he's going to remain disguised. He's dressed as an Egyptian ruler. He is speaking Egyptian. And therefore, they have no recognition point at this uh, stage. But Joseph is going to give them loads of clues to get them to think. And while they will see the clues, they are not able to put the jigsaw together. They just can't do it because their memory of what they've done and the man in front of them just doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit. Um, we also have the uh, same thing if you look at Jesus in our relationship with him. He is reigning on God's throne. He alone can save the whole world from the spiritual famine that is there in the loss of the word of God and the loss of faith and everything else. But he needs to bring us to repentance. He needs to bring us to recognize the sins and mistakes that we've actually made. And he needs to actually unite us. The church has never been so disunited. I mean, the seamless garment of Christ has been shredded. There are approximately 30,000 sects of Christianity, just to give one example, apart from the disunity that is within the Catholic Church itself. And so he has to bring about unity among us. He has got to get us to operate as a family, his family. And we have got to discover that even though he will allow trials and tribulations to come to us, that he loves us eternally. Jeremiah 31, 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. So the first thing we have now between verses 9 and 17 is that Joseph interrogates his brothers. Then Joseph remembered his dreams. Very interesting. And he said to his brothers, you are spies. You have come here uh, to see the nakedness of the land. In other words, to see some kind of disadvantage here so that you can come and attack it. Now, he knows his brothers. He knows they'd never do anything like that. Why does he call them spies? He is trying to make them uncomfortable. He is trying to make them think. But why spies? Now, what you find is that the books of the Bible don't give you all the details that you are looking for. They keep just to, to the main outlines of a story. But if you go to some of the books outside of the Bible, you will get details. Um, and I've mentioned perhaps the ancient book of Jasher, which tells the same story that's actually in the books, the early books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, and so on. And what the, the book of Jasher will tell you is that the 10 brothers were so uncomfortable coming into Egypt that they said, surely we will find Joseph among the slaves in the market. Surely he will be there. And they obviously wanted to liberate him. And so they decided to go in on various different gates of the city to see could they find him anywhere. They didn't because he was on the throne of Egypt. And so since Joseph is the administrator, and there are people coming from all over the world looking for grain. A report is sent to the administrator that this particular group, 
divided up into different smaller groups and entered the city by different gates. And so it would have been the people making this report to Joseph that would have said, these men are spies. They have come here for some kind of nefarious reason. And so this gives Joseph the opportunity to start making his brothers uncomfortable. Now, he knows these brothers are not spies, but he has to absolutely alert them to the fact that something new is happening. You see, as soon as they get into this situation, their consciences are aroused. And that's the first thing on this, the road to repentance. Uh, the prodigal son sitting uh, among the pigs began to think. And he began to think of his father's house and the conditions in his father's house. And that was necessary to begin the journey back. So getting these brothers to think about what happened and what Egypt means to them now is very important as a first step because God's grace is already working in them to bring about a process of repentance, which will bring about a reconciliation between the brothers, which will bring about unity in the family of Jacob. And once that unity in the family of Jacob is achieved, then they're all going to experience new life in Egypt something completely new. They're all going to move into a completely different stage of their journey. Uh, but the, the journey to that point is painful, but fruitful. It's a bit like a surgeon saying to a, a patient, look, I'm going to have to do a, a very dangerous operation on you, but there's life afterwards. So will you go through this pain? Will you go through this recovery in order to have life and it's because the patient wants life afterwards that they agree to the pain. Now, when you go to the letters of the Hebrews in chapter 12, uh, the author tells us that when God disciplines us uh, and when he allows trials and tribulations, we should accept the fact that he's treating us as children, as family, and therefore that he wants the best for us. And he wants us to come through to a completely new place with him. And so a very important journey has begun for the brothers, which they're not aware of at this particular point. Now, in verses 10 to 13, you find that the, the brothers begin gradually to open up and they begin to tell Joseph things that Joseph actually needs to know. Joseph knows that his father is old because he's one of the sons of his old age. He doesn't know if his father is still alive. And he wants to know where his brother, he only has one full brother, and that's Benjamin. And he wants to meet Benjamin very badly because he has had no connection with family for all of these years. And so they say to Joseph uh, in verse 13, your servants. Now, if they knew they were talking to Joseph, they would never have used that language. Your servants are 12 brothers sons of one man in the land of Canaan. In fact, the youngest is with our father today and one is no more. They've given Joseph very important information. That is that Jacob is still alive. They are his true, these brothers are Joseph's true family. That Benjamin is actually back with them and one is no more. They're telling Joseph that he is no more. Now, no more can be read in different ways. If they're telling Joseph he is dead, that doesn't make him dead. But they're certainly telling Joseph that one of the family is missing. They're not saying that they are responsible for that. And so Joseph reacts strongly to them again. I know you are spies and you're going to have to be treated as spies. Um, so it, it's interesting. But before I, I move on in the story, let's look at the fact that Joseph points to Jesus all the time. It's really fascinating that, you know, after the death of Jesus, those who had killed him absolutely refused to accept that he was alive and that he was continuing his mission. So they had it in their minds that he is gone and no testimony would make them accept that he was still alive. And so you see the, 
the persecution that happened in the early church because of this. Joseph decides to put his brothers to the test and the test is going to be painful, but it will be fruitful. And they, he's going to do something because he is desperate to see both his father and his brother. They're the two he, he really, really wants to see very badly. And so what he does is he puts the, on the grounds that they are spies, he puts the 10 men into prison for three days. They were responsible for him being in jail for 12 years. Three days might make them think. And you're going to find a correspondence between everything they did to him and he gives them the tiniest taste of it in order to awaken their consciences. And the first clue he gives them is that he takes them out of the prison after three days. He tells them, yes, I want you to go back and feed your family. Why should a foreign king who has apparently never met these people before be anxious that they would actually go home and feed their families? And why is he so anxious to meet that one that is back at home? That's the first clue. He has made them think. Why should he care about their family? But what you find is it's going to take time. They don't even look at Joseph yet. What they did was they bowed down to the ground. And in responding to him, they would have been looking at each other and so on. They haven't really looked at Joseph. They've not looked into that face that they rejected so many years ago. And they have to do that. When they do, everything will change. So the three days in prison gave them their first experience of humiliation and they became more compliant. So when he takes them out of prison, you know, they were treated well in prison, they weren't treated badly. <laughs> they weren't misused or, or punished or anything. And when he takes them out of prison, he says to them something that should have awoken their thinking. But I'm fascinated at how long it took them to realize what was actually happening. So this is verse 18. Then Joseph said to them on the third day, do this and you will live, for I fear God. Surely an Egyptian is not going to use that kind of language. But a son of Abraham would. Someone living in Abraham's covenant would. Someone who's in a relationship with the true God would. And the favorite son of Jacob would. I fear God. That's been his position all the time. But he's not using the language of Egyptian religion. And it should have alerted them. Why is he talking like this? He said, if you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, but you go and carry the grain uh, to, of the famine to your home. And verse 20 says, and bring your youngest brother to me so that your words will be verified and you will not die. The immediate reaction was a sense of guilt. They are going to have to bring Benjamin down to Egypt. Joseph has actually done something quite incredible and he's done it all in one move. He's going to hold one of them as a guarantor that Benjamin will come back. And the one he actually gets is a big surprise. Uh, only if you have remembered all the detail that I've given to you about Jacob's sons, because Joseph is quite clear about what he's doing and who it is he will keep as the guarantor. But first of all, uh, he gets a confession out of them. And because Joseph is one of them, he understands Hebrew, he knows exactly what they're saying. They said to one another, in other words, they're not talking to Joseph. We are truly guilty concerning our brother, that is Joseph himself. For we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us and we would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Now, this is exactly what Joseph wanted, is that 
the memory of the past would come to them and they'd begin dealing with it. And they've made a connection between uh, what is happening to them now and what happened to them afterwards. And the amazing thing is, it was the three days in prison when they had plenty of time to think and to talk to each other because they would have been all together. That brought them to this conclusion. That's a pretty good conclusion, that we wouldn't listen to him in his anguish. And what we're going to discover later on is that it took 20 years for the anguish of Joseph in the pit to be heard by his brothers, but they had to experience a little bit of that pit themselves. They had to experience a little bit of prison before they would actually come around to this. Now, why does Joseph decide to keep one of them as a guarantor? It's because he knows that the famine is going to go on for seven years. They don't know that yet. And so he wants them to take the grain back because he loves his family. In spite of everything that has happened, he, has lo he loves his family. He has done something very, very clever. The price of the survival of the chosen people is the presence of Benjamin in Egypt. That's very clever because they know they can't come back for more grain unless Benjamin is with them. So this is the price. And we're going to see Joseph doesn't want any other money from them. The only price he wants is the presence of Benjamin. And so the, the very future of Jacob's household is in Joseph's hands. Joseph is now completely in control. The brothers are helpless. They don't know what the plan is. They don't know what Joseph is up to. They don't know even why he has any interest in them. They are not picking up any clues. And even though the clues are actually there, it is their own unrepented sin that complicates them and complicates their responses. And Joseph is their victim. And only the victim can set them free. Our modern world has completely forgotten that it is the victim that can only set the perpetrator free because the evil is in the perpetrator. And if the victim forgives, then they can be set free. If the victim holds them in judgment, they are held in a pit. They're under judgment all the time. And so their own conscience will condemn them and they have the judgment of the victim and others on top of that as well. But forgiveness sets the whole thing free. It's like that you open something out and make it possible for new life. So this is what Joseph is going to do for them. So they don't realize that Joseph hears this confession. And they don't also realize what is written in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, that you reap what you sow. So these brothers are having a problem and they don't realize Joseph actually hears them. And they don't realize that they are beginning to reap what they have sown. And Reuben makes the problem even greater for them. Reuben is the firstborn of Leah. And verse 22 says, and Reuben answered them saying, they're having this conversation in Joseph's presence, thinking that Joseph doesn't understand. Did I not speak to you saying, do not sin against the boy? And you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. Now that piece of information was actually very important for Joseph because he knows one of his brothers did not want him dead. One of them did not want him sold. And so you'll find in the rest of the whole drama that happens that Joseph won't allow uh, Reuben to pay any price. Reuben is let off the hook all the time. And it's because Joseph hears this, because this is his first time to hear them talk about the event. Verse 23 says, they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. But having heard that even one of the brothers was not guilty, that's extraordinarily important. Joseph turned himself away from them and wept. One of my brothers has not condemned me. One of my brothers did not think evil of me. And then he turned back to them again and talked to them. And 
he did something that needs to be explained. He took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. And this would have been a complete shock for the brothers. Why would it have been a complete shock? Well, if you remember what we've already done, Simeon and Levi were the two fierce men who went into Shechem and murdered all the men in the city and took the women and children as slaves. He was strong. He was powerful. He was fierce. If he had fought Joseph, surely he could have knocked him down, this prince of Egypt. Why did Joseph choose ben, uh, Simeon? It's because we're not told all the conversation that actually happened. And Joseph realizes that it was Simeon who seized him and who bound him and threw him into the pit. So Simeon is seized roughly now, bound, and he's going to be held for 12 months until these men come back with Benjamin. In other words, Simeon has got to have time to think. Simeon has got to have time to repent. If you just get away with something, you cannot learn from it. You cannot go forward. And so the binding of Simeon would have been completely astonishing for the brothers. And so I'm explaining that he doesn't necessarily have to have um, submitted meekly to this because it seems that Joseph got his officers to do this strongly because Simeon would have resisted. So now you have the problem from verse 25 that nine of the brothers go back to Jacob and they have to try and explain why one of them is left in Egypt. But this is not the first time that these men have come back to Jacob with one of their brothers missing. They did that 20 years ago when they told Jacob a blatant lie about his son Joseph. But even though Joseph has spoken roughly to them and that he has taken uh, Simeon as a guarantor and he's going to hold him and they can do nothing about it, he's the administrator of Egypt. At the same time, Joseph gives them another clue. He wants them to actually hear what's going on. So Joseph gave a command, this is verse 25, uh, to fill their sacks with grain and to restore every man's money back into the sack. What's he doing? He's giving them the grain free. He'd never do this for anyone outside of family. And so Joseph is trying to tell them, will you look at me as family? Take a second look, really look. I'm not the person you think I am. And so uh, step by step, it's going to be such a shock to them to discover who Joseph really is, uh, that he does it step by step for them. And not only that, but he gave them provisions for the journey that would never have been done for anybody else going to Egypt looking for grain. They would have handed over a certain amount of money and for that exact amount of money, they would have got a certain amount of grain and off you go and you take care of yourselves. But all these, this special attention is being given to these men. Uh, so they loaded the donkeys with the grain and they departed from there. But one of them opened his sack to give his donkey feed at the encampment and he saw the money and their hearts sank. I think that's very interesting. Joseph is trying to get them to come round and they are having difficulty doing just that because all of us find it difficult to face a major problem in our lives, particularly when we are guilty, and to face the consequences of it and to repent and therefore be able to step forward into a new life. Because you cannot go forward unless you deal with what is in the past. This is the, the next clue, as I said, uh, that Joseph is saying to them. Why, instead of feeling guilty, one of the brothers said, uh, my money has been restored and there it is in my sack. <gasps> then their hearts failed them and they were afraid and they said to one another, what is this thing that God is doing to us? They seem to be aware of the fact that somehow God is in charge of the whole thing. They know that what is happening to them is happening on the inside. It's spiritual 
and yet they're not getting it yet. They are not asking the one question they should ask. Who is this man who's ruling Egypt? Why is he interested in our father? Why is he interested in our brother? Why is he giving us special attention? Why aren't we just dealt with like everybody else? They're not asking those questions, and if they did, they would find the answers an awful lot quicker than they did. So Joseph showed them that he, he loved them, he cared for the family, but he was not weak, and he was going to deal with them as a ruler, or he was going to take what they call the lion card in dealing with them, because he needed to be strong with these men. If he showed any weakness, then they would have the upper hand and we would get nowhere. Again, uh, Joseph points to Jesus, who is the true saviour of the world, who loves us all infinitely, eternally, absolutely, regardless of who we are or what age we live in. And he showers us all with graces before we ever repent. While he is looking for uh, recovery in us, he has to show us an enormous amount of care and generosity. And we mightn't even ask, who is he? We mightn't even acknowledge that it really is him. We might call it luck, bad luck or good luck. We mightn't actually acknowledge who it is. So these brothers are aware of the fact that they're being tested and they know that God is behind it. Joseph, in their first interview, accused them of being spies. Now that the money is in the sack, they could be accused of being thieves now, the problem about this is that in those days, a thief would be killed. So they're feeling very fragile. Joseph has put them into a position of fragility, even though he is actually trying to reach out to them and he's trying to bring them round. But of course, if you're going to have to go through a big repentance experience, God has to bring us to a point of fragility and a point of helplessness so that we will throw ourselves on his mercy. And only then can he actually bring us around. Their consciences were now completely alive and they were so aware of their sinfulness that they cannot see that any love is being shown to them or any care. So verse 29, uh, the nine men have to return to Jacob and to try and explain why Simeon is not with them and why the money was in the sacks. And poor Jacob is going to have a problem because he doesn't know what's going on either. Then they went to their father, Jacob, in the land of Canaan and told him what had happened to them, saying, the man who was Lord of the land spoke roughly to us and took us for spies. But we said to them, we're honest men, we're not spies. We are 12 brothers, sons of our father. One is no more and the youngest is with him in the land of Canaan. I'm not giving you every single word. And then the man, the Lord of this country said to us, by this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me and take food back to your families. But you must bring the youngest brother to me. Why didn't they ask? Why would this man in Egypt want their youngest brother to come to him? What difference would it make to a complete stranger? They are being challenged to think, think, think. Even Jacob doesn't get it because all of this information is completely new to him. So we will reflect on this in our next episode. Thank you for listening. Slána Gospanach Day Live. Goodbye. God bless you. I want to give you a little message from me, and that is that the Word of God is the second great food that God has given to us. The first one is the Eucharist. The second one, the manna from heaven, is the Word of God. And the third one is prayer. But in order to give people the Word of God, a lot of people have to do an enormous amount of work. They have to go into a great deal of research and do a lot of homework. You mightn't realize it. Jesus told his apostles that the laborer was worthy of his hire. And in other words, that they were to feed the people spiritually, but that the people should enable the apostles to be able to do the work. So I want to make a little uh, plea for you on behalf of Shalom World TV. 
to ask you that if the Word of God is really feeding you, it's, if it's giving you life, if it really is what God wanted it to be, and we're trying very hard to do that, that you would respond by enabling them to be able to continue giving you this. Your donation would actually give life to others and enable them to work. And the Lord would reward you and we would be very grateful. Thank you. Turn back towards God. Rise up.